So John chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptised more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptise, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again, again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. Notice it says he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the, by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me that the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And at this point, his disciples came 
And they marvelled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out to the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he reaps, and he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not laboured. Others have laboured, and you have entered into their labours. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, but for, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. My word, what a, what a passage. <clears throat> Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, it's sharper than the two-edged sword will cut through and reveal what you want us to know and understand about this passage of Scripture. And so, Lord, we lay it all before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's a, a long passage of Scripture. I told George it was a marathon. It is a marathon. I thought about cutting it down, but I couldn't see how I could cut it down because it was such good stuff. And we all had to hear it. I want you to picture the scene. There's Jesus. He's just been... Uh, oh, his disciples have been baptising people. And uh, the Pharisees have come to him and all sorts of things have happened. And he decides to go back to Galilee. Now, he doesn't go the normal way of the Jews. If you notice and hear, read the story, the Jews would not go through Samaria. They didn't like it. They didn't like the people. I didn't go back into it, but something must have happened that they didn't like them. And they didn't have anything to do with them. They wouldn't talk to them. And so they would go the longer way, round the bottom of, of Samaria, round by the, uh, the um, Jordan, I, mean, I can't think what it was, but, but along through and um, round that way. And it was a bit, bit longer, it wasn't the most direct, but Jesus wasn't having any of that. He wasn't going to be put off by other people. And so he went on a journey which a good Jew wouldn't go. He went to a place that a good Jew wouldn't be seen. And you know, as I, I thought about this, I thought, do you know, in the days in which we live, God's going to take us into places where we wouldn't normally go and speak to people 
that we wouldn't normally speak to. And to be in places where probably even sometimes we would feel uncomfortable about it. As we read in further, a bit further on, the Jew, his disciples weren't that comfortable about where they were too. If, if you remember the story we had read to us by George. But, you know, Jesus knew what he was doing. And as Jesus came to this, this well, he sat down. Do you know, Jesus knew what was going on. He was in complete control. And as he was stood or sat there, I don't know where our palm trees or what it did, I surmised that having palm trees and he was in the shade, I don't know. I can't tell you, that was my mind. And you can have your own picture of where it's to. But he sat there and all of a sudden this lady comes. And it must have been quite, I'm trying to think what the six hour was, I, I couldn't think what it was. So I think it was about 12 o'clock, I'm not sure. So it was midday. Well, you know, most people don't go out at midday, let alone get in water at midday. So she must have felt a bit of an outcast as a woman because of her past. And when she got to the well, she was surprised to see Jesus, but Jesus knew she was coming. It was a God encounter time. Jesus knew and knew that she was going to come and he was going to encounter this woman. Do you know, that's what we want. As a church, we want people to have a God encounter time. That God puts us in places where we have a God encounter time. And as she came to the, the well, Jesus asked her and said, can you give me a drink? Simple, wasn't it? You see, Jesus took the simple things of what was going on round about and started a conversation up. Surprised the woman was that she even, he even spoke to her. She was taken back. But it was just an ordinary conversation. Please, can you give me a drink? Nothing supernatural about it at that moment. And you know, as she started to speak, she must have wondered, what was he on about? Why was this Jew talking to me? And then as we read on the story, Jesus took it from natural to supernatural, using the same words about water. And all of a sudden, this woman has been taken from natural to supernatural. All the heavenly things started to come out, you know, and that reminded us that we can take things from natural to supernatural quite easily if we allow the Holy Spirit to take us into the next step he wants us to say. And so often we get worried about what we're saying when it's quite often the simple things that has the most impact on people. We think we've got to be very, very super, super spiritual and we've got to have all this. But no, God takes from the simple, the start, and takes us and leads us and starts a conversation that leads to this woman listening and trying to understand what's going on. And, you know, as, uh, as uh, he spoke to her, and I, I thought this was a really interesting sort of thing, he says to her, now go and tell your husband. Now Jesus knew all about her. Isn't that, isn't that remarkable? He knew she was going to be there at the well. And he knew all about her situation. And as he spoke, she said, I haven't got a husband. She, he said, well, that's the truth. You're telling me the truth. I mean, she could have said all sorts of things, but I believe because she was in God's presence, the truth came out. She said, that's the truth. She said, uh, and he says to her, actually, you've had five other husbands and this one isn't your husband. But you see, what struck me is that, one thing that really struck me, I don't know if it struck you as uh, 
we were reading that, Jesus didn't write her off. He didn't say, well, sorry, can't do anything for you. Sometimes the past, when we know the past of people, clouds our minds of what God can do. But one encounter from Jesus changed her life. Her past was not the problem. God dealt with that. And so often we can um, judge people or look at people by their appearance, what they're like. I was listening um, on TV the other day to a, um, I think I might have mentioned it, I'll mention it again, uh, a prisoner. He was in prison and he had an encounter with God in prison and he gave his life to Jesus. And not only that, God told him, when you, now you're in prison, I want you to talk to the new inmates, to bring them in to, uh, to feel at home. And, to, and so he started doing that and um, he had a great success and the, the warder would give him that job of talking to the inmates as they, the new ones came in and he was in, able to introduce them to God at the same time. And then God says, when you come out, I want you to take up, make up a, a retreat for ex-prisoners. As they come out, there's a place that they can go and um, be re re-inhabit. What's the word? Um, that's the word. Thank you very much. I knew I could rely on you, Brendan. <laughs> Being re 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 rehabilitated to, to the world. And not only that, they came to know Jesus and they interviewed several people who come. And um, I, I was excited. Oh, wow. A man that society probably wrote, written off, but God took hold of him. And so we don't know who we're talking to, what God's going to do. What God's going to do with those people. And you know, as they sort of, uh, as she spoke, as he spoke, he, she said, well, you must be a prophet because you know all these things. And this took me to 1 Corinthians. Jesus was able to tell this woman her past. Probably a lot of it she hid. You know, God says when we prophesy and that in meetings and that when we're coming together like this, people walking in and we are prophesying about something we don't even know them they will get convinced and convicted of their sin and fall down and worship God and say, God is among you. Wow! I'm excited about that. I'm really excited about that. I can see that happening. I don't know if anyone's got a picture of that, but I have. Because we started off with pictures so we can see God moving in us in such a way that we are hearing from God and we're just saying things that God's telling us and someone comes in and says, I remember one person said, every time I go to church, it feels like they're talking to me, about me. The, 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 preacher must have come, uh, the preacher must have heard something about me before I even walked in. That's the presence of God. That's God working through us to deliver what God wants. Jesus spoke to her about worship. You know, great worshippers are the Jews and great worshippers sounds like the Samaritans. And they worship in different ways. One says, well, we've got to worship in Jerusalem. That's the best place to go. The other one said, no, we've got to worship here be up in the mountain because that's where our ancestors. And God says, I'm doing away with all that. True worshippers will worship God in spirit and in truth. I wonder what you thought about that when someone said that. I thought, that must have been a lot of... But when you think about it, true worshippers will worship in spirit and in truth. Spirit. We want the Holy Spirit to lead us into that worship. So that we worship God, not just with our mouths, not with our thoughts, but with our spirits, which takes us from a dimension that 
we're in daily to a, a dimension that God wants us to be in. It takes us from where we are to where we are in God. You know, I want to be in your presence, God. I want to be in your presence. And the way we can do it is letting the Holy Spirit take us in our worship and our praise and our adoration. And then it says he wants to worship in truth. What's truth? Truth. Truth is what we really mean. I bet you've been into meetings sometimes and I've been there. When we worship, it's not, it's mouth worship. We go along with what, because we, especially when we know, I like sometimes these songs here because we don't know. I've got to look at the words. But sometimes we just know them when we just flow them out. But at the end of it, there's no truth about it in us. But when you've got to read the words, you've got to, it's got to be truth. And God says that's what he's looking for. Not that we worship in a certain place or a certain way or a certain thing, but it's truth and it's in the spirit. And so he was starting to lay things down in this lady's life, which was mind-changing to her. Mind changing. You know, in verse 27 it says, the disciples were astonished in mind, it said. Astonished that he was talking to this woman. But they wouldn't say anything. But he knew that what they were saying because he could understand what their thoughts were. But they were astonished. And so, you know, as I was reading that, I thought, wow. If people give that impression, you know, you can get an impression from someone by the way they act because of what you're doing. And because of that, it puts you off. You know, it's, it's quite uh, interesting when you're speaking from the front and you look right at people and impressions of people can sometimes put you off. You think, they're not listening. You know, I mean, all of a sudden you think, I'm not getting, I'm not trying, I'm trying to get over, I'm afraid, don't do it here. So thank you, Lord, for that. <laughs> but I have seen, you know, I've been in places where you sort of, and you think, wow. And it can put you off what God's got for you. Don't let people put you off what God's given you to do. Don't be put off by the people round about saying, why did you go there? Why did you speak to that person? Why did you get yourself involved in that way? If God's told you, God's the person you need to answer to, not to the people round about you. And you know, sometimes when things happen in God and extraordinary things happen, people will question what is going on. They will. They'll question. You Christians will question what is going on. Why are you doing this? Why do you worship like that? Why is this happening in your meetings? What's happening here? And why is that happening? You know, but don't be put off because if it's God, it will last. You know, Jesus went on to tell them that your joy is doing what the Father wants. It says his food. And, but he, he was, I believe he was trying to say that his nourishment comes from doing what the Father wants us to do. And you know, when we get to the point of seeing people saved for Jesus, there's no greater thrill. When we see people turning back who walked away from Jesus and start to come to work, that's a thrill. That's joy. That's nourishment for us. That's excitement. That causes us and makes us to go on and on to do another and another and another and another thing. Because that's where the food comes from that keeps us going. Seeing Jesus being lifted up and men and women coming to know him. Because he once goes on to say, and I, I won't go and I'll come back to it another day, but he goes on to say about the harvest. Some sow, some reap. But he said, I'm going to send you into places where no, you have never sown, but others have. And you know, out in these fields round about it, there's a lot of people that know a bit about Jesus. 
a bit. When you test them, they know a bit. A lot of people say, I don't know nothing. But all of a sudden, what we say can make that seed, the words we say can make that seed grow. So Jesus said, I'm going to send you out into the, the harvest field that is ripe. And when you say these few things about, what, about me, you'll be surprised the reaction you're going to get. You'll be surprised at the reaction you're going to get from people because I've sown the seeds, other people have sown the seeds already and as you go to harvest, the seeds will be ripe for harvest. So be encouraged. God has got a harvest for us to do. He'll send us to places where we never thought. Do not be despondent. Do not write people off because of what they were. As we go and re uh, read on a bit further, and I just say this as we look another day, but she brought people back to Jesus because of his testimony. One of Brendan's famous passages in Revelation is, and the will of our testimony. Well, here we are. She brought them back. And I love that last bit, and you read at the end of that passage that George read to us, it says, We have heard him for ourselves. We have heard for ourselves. So our job is to bring him to know Jesus. She told his testimony, which got them involved, and you come and listen to this man. And when they heard the man, Jesus, they said, we believe. We believe. So our job is not just to tell them, but to bring them into a relationship with knowing Jesus. So we encourage. I hope you've uh, got a few thoughts out of our uh, uh, very old um, passages of Scripture that we've probably heard many, many times. But God has got a plan for us as a church and as individuals. Let's walk into where God wants us, even though it might be a place where you wouldn't always like to go. And we're just going to pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for all that we've done. It will be to your honour and to your glory. Teach us, Lord, as we've been thinking about, to be people who will go where we always don't always think we need to be going. To be ready to listen and to not write people off. Be ready to worship you as we should and lead people to you. So Lord, we thank you for this morning. We ask your blessing on us as a church and on us as a Zoom, that your name will be lifted up and glorified in this town and in the areas which we live, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.